I'm just kidding with you. It's, it's so good to be in church tonight. I mean that. It's so good to be here, be, be, be with God's people, and uh, the Lord knows exactly what we need. I've had a verse uh, on my heart, and, and I told you this morning it was it would probably be a little little unconventional. Uh, and it's I, when I say unconventional, it's not it's not because of of the message, um, but I've had this verse on my heart since my my cousin passed away last week. And uh, I had the opportunity to, to, to preach her homegoing service on Friday, and I appreciate those of you that prayed for my family, uh, prayed for me as I was doing the as I was doing the service. Many of you texted me and said, "Hey, I just wanted you to know I'm praying for you this morning," and or while you're traveling and all that. And uh, <clears throat> and so I, I I had a verse that was just really on my heart, and it's a familiar verse. Uh, you know, there's sometimes that you do. Um, I know that most of you probably never, never done a funeral, but there's times that you do that, and there's, there's so. So many verses that we're, we're so familiar with that are just, we, we, we look at them as funeral texts, but you do understand that they're not funeral texts, okay? They're just, they're, they're comforting texts. And uh, I, was, I was thinking, and, and Lord, which way to go? And, and, and you know, my, my cousin was born again. She knew the Lord as her Savior. She had a, an open testimony, uh, a good testimony before a family, before a church family. And uh, so I wanted to do something that would honor her, but then also... You want to honor the Lord whenever you do that. And uh, so the Lord just began to work in my, in my heart about some verses, and I just was thinking, and I, I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm driving up the road. We've got about a four and a half, three, three and a half, four, four and a half hour trip, and mom and dad are in the car, and they're talking, and I'm talking, but I'm thinking, and all this, and this, this verse just keeps coming back to my mind, keeps coming back to my mind. And I just want to share my, my heart with you tonight, and I hope that'll be okay. We're going to look at the scriptures tonight. So go to John 14. And you say, well, preacher, I know where you're going. You're going to verse number one. Well, guess what? Absolutely right. That's exactly where I'm going. You look at these passages of Scripture, but sometimes uh, we, we look at them and we overlook some of the, some of the most simplistic portions of these Scriptures, including what, what is he talking about when he makes this statement? What did Jesus mean when he said these verses? What was, what was he referencing in this, in this, in this ideal? And I begin to look at, at this verse, and, and if once you find your place, stand with me. And I, I promise you tonight, I, I want to get right to the point, and I just want to share my heart with you, and we're going to pray, and we'll, we'll give an invitation, and we'll go to the house. But listen to what, what verse number 1 says of John chapter number 14. He says, Let not your heart be troubled, you believe in God, believe also in me. Now that's so simple. That's so very simple. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And I want to take this text for just a little while and, and uh, I'll I just confess to mom and dad, they've heard a lot of this. And, uh, but I just want to take this text and I just want to try to share my heart with you uh, tonight and I'll tell you why here in just a minute. But let's bow together and let's pray one more time. Father, we love you. And I thank you for another opportunity that we have to stand. God, it's been a wonderful day to be in your house. God, we've witnessed, God, the, the, the grace of God right before our very eyes. God, we've got, we got to witness a soul born again into the family of God. 
God, we got to see that. God, we're, 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 we're a testament of it. God, you allowed us to watch that. You allowed us to, to be here when that took place. God, there are people literally all over this, all over this country who never, never get to see that in, in, the, in a church setting. God, they've never watched an individual come to know Christ as their personal Savior. And God, we're an honored and a blessed people that you would even show up in our midst today. And so, Father, tonight we, we want to just begin by, by giving you the praise and the glory. God, we've heard many testimonies tonight about your faithfulness and about your goodness. And God, how that we're not worthy. God, every, everything that was said is so very true. But God, you are worthy. And God, you're worthy to be praised. And God, your name is above every name. And God, it's a name that's going to require one day every knee will bow. And God, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And God, I'm thankful that by your grace, you've allowed me to bow on this side of eternity. And God, you've allowed me to profess you as my Savior. God, you've worked in my heart. Holy Spirit of God dealt with me about my sinful condition and your marvelous grace. Father, tonight, I just want to thank you for that once again. I thank you for the good testimony all around this place that we've heard this evening. God, I thank you for answered prayer. God, I thank you for people, God, that make up Hope Baptist Tabernacle. And so, Father, tonight I pray, dear Lord, as we open your word, I pray that you'll fill our minds, God, with what needs to be filled. God, I pray that you'll help us to forget the things of yesterday. God, forget the business of tomorrow, the coming weeks, and God, just to focus on your word. God, it was already testified. I think Libby said it. God, you know what we need even when we don't know it. And so, Father, I pray that you'll help us through your word tonight. We ask God for the sweet presence of the Holy Spirit of God, Lord, to fill this place. God, guard me from my flesh. God, Lord, help me not to say anything that would hinder, grieve, or quench. God, the movement of the Spirit of God. And God, I pray, God, that you'll have free course and free reign in this place. Lord, if there's one that's lost tonight, God, uh, Lord, that don't know Christ as their Savior. God, maybe one that, le that left this morning lost. I pray, God, that you'll work in their heart even right now. And God, will give you the praise and the honor and glory for all that you do. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for standing tonight. You can be seated. There's a lot of things in life. And here's really what sparked, sparked this thought. Jesus says, let not your heart be what? Troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. Every now and again, on, if, if, for those of you that have social media, you have Facebook, it'll come up and it'll say memories. Uh, now some memories are worthwhile. Some of them bring a smile to your face and then some of them realize, well, just how ignorant I was when I posted that. <laughs> some of them are heartwarming. Some of them are heartbreaking. When you go back to realize, hey, this is what was going on back in, in such and such a date. Now, I like them because I like to go back and I like to see my grandbabies. I like to watch them when they were born and we had them on this day and they stayed in our house and, and we had a big sleepover. We had this and man, that brings comfort to my heart. But then there's also some times that you can read on there and somebody posted a prayer request for a family that was in the hospital for someone that was sick and someone that needed prayer or someone that, uh, that was in an accident. Or, or, and so all of these things, uh, but all of these things bring up things that can trouble us. I began to think about the last few weeks. You know, uh, we, have, we, have, we have had some people that have experienced some trouble in the last few weeks, in the last few months. Some things that if, they were to, if we would have asked them, they never probably would have dreamed they'd ever went through those things. We've witnessed some that's lost loved ones. We've witnessed that some have battled cancer and sickness. We've witnessed as those that surgeries didn't go as planned. We've witnessed over the last course of a couple of years or so, or so, some that one time was was among our fellowship now are not a part of any fellowship. And we've witnessed troubles. We've witnessed it firsthand. And there are all kinds of things in our life that can cause what you say, trouble. The word trouble here, as it's used in John chapter number 14, is a word that means this, to strike one's heart with fear and dread. Now notice, it's to strike one's heart. It is the very essence to strike one at the very core of who they are, of how they feel, how they make decisions, the seat of their emotions. Uh, the word trouble means to strike to the very core of the emotional makeup of who you are. And yet Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. I thought about this. I just wrote some things down, and you, you probably got your own list, but what can trouble a person's heart? I thought about pain. 
You know, pain, man, pain can bring trouble. Pain can wrestle in your mind. What's going to happen? Sickness can go hand in hand. I'm not the uncertainties of tomorrow, what may or may not happen, or how's this thing going to wind up, or how's it going to end. And, and it might just not just be for you, but it might be for someone that you love. And now there's a wrestling that goes on with inside of you. There's an unsettledness, or there's a troubledness about your heart. I think about loss, the loss of a loved one, the loss of someone that you care about, the loss of, uh, really not just the loss of life, but the loss of a lot of things can trouble your heart. Loss of security, the loss of a job, finances can cause trouble. Trials and testings that come along our way can cause our hearts to be troubled. Certainly death can trouble our hearts. <coughs> Certainly death can trouble our hearts. Relationships, you know, the, the severing of relationships can trouble our heart. If you ever have a problem, I'll just give you this. If you ever have a trouble, you ever have problems between you and a brother and sister in Christ, I'll promise you this, it'll trouble your heart. There'll, there'll be an uneasiness about your soul. You say, why is that? You don't want that division. You don't want that division. Sometimes something as simple as a misunderstanding that if you just pick up the telephone and say, hey, can we meet? Can we talk? Uh, listen, it's happened to me. Uh, I, I just feel like there's something between us. Preacher, I feel that way too. And before long you get to talking and you realize that maybe both of you even just overreacted a little. You say, what is that? Man, it troubles your heart. Why? You love one another. But man, it can cause trouble. But particularly in this situation, you find here that death brought trouble. Now, you say, what, what is happening? Jesus is telling his disciples, I'm getting ready to go away. You say, Lord, well, well, what do you mean, Lord, you're getting ready to go away? I mean, we've been traveling together. We sold everything. We gave everything that we had to travel with you, and now you're telling me you're going to leave us. We thought you was going to set up your kingdom. We thought we were going to usher in. We were going to follow you into the kingdom. We're going, we're going to watch you rule and reign. You're going to make restoration in Israel. God, we're, we're willing to follow you. What, what do you mean that you're leaving? Jesus said exactly that. He was telling them about his death. He was preparing them for what could trouble their heart. All right, and so he had told the disciples, I'm going to go, go away. Look at verse number, chapter number 13. Let me pick up the pace a little bit. He said, little children, yet a little while, verse 33. And I am with you. You shall seek me as I said unto, you, unto the Jews, whether I go, you cannot come. So now I say unto you, he said, I'm going away. And you can't come with me yet. Now, don't over-spiritualize the conversation. They were willing to follow him anywhere. They were willing to go everywhere with him. In fact, Peter, and I believe, I believe that when Peter said, I'm willing to die with you, I believe that Peter meant that from the very top of his head to the bottom of his feet. I don't think Peter was just talking. I believe that Peter, with all intents, purposes in his heart, was prepared to die with Jesus Christ. I just don't believe Peter knew how weak he really was. His intentions were right. His motives, I believe, were right at the time. And yet Jesus said, I'm going somewhere and you can't come with me. Now this brought trouble or this would have brought trouble to their life. But more significant than that, Jesus is getting ready to go to Calvary. He is getting ready to pay my sin debt and your sin debt and it's going to cause a severance in the physical relationship or the physical location between he and his disciples. And he said, I'm going away. And so separation was inevitable. Now, it is to this news that Jesus continues the thought of chapter 13 into chapter number 14 when he says, let not your heart be troubled. You think that Jesus may have picked up on, hmm, this could bother them a little bit. Obviously, I'm being facetious. I think absolutely Jesus understood that this is bad news for these men. These men are gonna, they're not gonna see the big picture. Isn't that the way it goes? We see just a little window, don't we? I mean, we see just a little tiny window when God sees the whole view uh, in sight. You know, we look, have you ever, have you ever seen a, you know, looked at a picture and you look out a picture, you think, man, that's beautiful. And, we, and it's a, maybe a picture of a mountaintop or a sunrise and, and we just get a little window into that, into that view. But someone that's standing out on the mountain, man, they see the whole gorgeous uh, horizon out before them and they get the whole view. God says, well, Jesus said, well, you know, they're just getting a little view. And he said, now listen, fellas, I'm leaving. And right now you can't come with me. And you can almost see their countenance, can't you? He said, wait a minute, let not your heart 
be troubled. Now, when I think about this fact, there's a couple things that it reminds me of, and I'm going to give you three quick things. Number one, when I see that Jesus would take the time to give us verse number one after he gives verse number 36, 37, and 38, I believe this, I believe that it's a revealer to us about the care in Jesus' heart for the condition of our heart. Don't, don't miss that. I believe that John 14, 1 is a revealer to men that Jesus cares about your heart. Jesus cares for your heartbreaks. Oh, yes, he does. You say, preacher, you don't understand. This world has chewed me up and has spit me out. My, my heart is beat down. My heart is weary. My heart is full of trouble. Can I tell you, Jesus cares about your troubled heart. Listen, that may not help you now, but if you'll ever get your mind wrapped around the fact that, you're, listen, your family may not understand, your friends may not understand, your preacher may not understand, but there is an almighty, divine, holy God of heaven that cares about the condition of your troubled heart. He took the time to stop and right in the middle of his whole discourse to look at those 11 men that he loved, that he cherished, that he poured his life into for some three and a half years, and he said, I want to stop right here and say, let not your heart be troubled. Let me tell you something. I'm not preaching about an impersonal God who's to, who to you, he's nothing more than a number down the list of creation, but I'm talking about a holy, righteous, loving God of heaven who cares about the condition of your heart. If you're here today and you're dealing with trouble, you're dealing with heartbreak and heartache and sorrow and pain, and you don't know where to turn, you don't know where to go next, can I tell you exactly where you ought to run? Listen, it's fine to run to somebody that loves you. It's fine to run to a friend. It's fine to run to a family, but the best place you'll ever run is to go to this one who took the time to say, let not your heart be troubled. It reveals to us the character and the caliber of the heart of Christ that he cares about our heart. But it also in this verse, also we can see the calm of our heart. Let not your heart be troubled. You ever try to calm somebody down that's upset? I mean, that's really upset. Our, our granddaughter, she, she might be a little emotional. Sophia was in, and, and uh, man, if she skins her knee, buddy, it's, it, it's, it's, it's that gasping, <laughs> wounded, you know. And Cassie will go to her and she'll say, hey, listen, breathe. breathe. Look at me. Breathe with mommy. Breathe with mommy. And so she's helping her. She's trying to get, get, get her come, come back down. You know, she's trying to get her back down. Can I tell you something? When it talks about there is a calming when our heart's troubled that, that we can experience and that we can have. Now, I want you to see what he says. He said, let not your heart be troubled. That means to, to allow not your heart to be troubled. Right. To allow not, let not your heart be troubled. We have an opportunity. Now listen to this. We have an opportunity and a responsibility to reason in our heart through our circumstance. You know what? It's our natural inclination to do. Our natural inclination is to respond emotionally. Natural. Natural. You say, well, preacher, what do you mean? If somebody comes up and just... And just smacks you in the mouth, you're going to respond emotionally. Now, depending on how your emotional makeup is, it's going to depend on how you respond, but you're going to respond emotionally. Some of you is going to cry. Some of you is going to be flabbergasted, and some of you is going to hit him back. Before you know what happened, you're going to respond emotionally. But do you know a child? To, but do you know for the, that for a child of God, God has given us the, a command because let not your heart be troubled is really a command. He's not. At, he's telling them, "Hey, don't allow this to run away to, to, to run away with you. Don't allow your emotion to run away with you and carry you further than what I've taught you." He has given us the opportunity to reason through our circumstance that we may not allow that troubled times to trouble our heart, to burden us beyond necessity. Are you following what I'm saying? Jesus is getting ready to die. There's no doubt about it. It's not going to be a pleasant day. It's not going to be a, be a day for the disciples of joyous celebration, but he has given them the words and he has given them promise and he has given them hope that, listen, men, when this takes place, reason through the emotional response. Let not your heart be troubled. Now, that's easier 
said than none. Have you ever known the truth of something but you still can't get over the emotion of it? Look, I know that Jesus is coming back. I know that he's coming back. But I still get tore up when I look at the condition of this world. I know he's coming back. I know that he's in control. But sometimes I can't see him like I wish I could see him. And so he's given us the opportunity and the responsibility not to respond emotionally, but also to respond rationally. Now I want to give us some things tonight if, if, the, if the Lord will help me. and I, that's, that's my heart tonight, that the Lord will help us. He shares with them his plan for a troubled heart. Aren't you glad God's got a plan, by the way? Aren't you thankful? Listen, I don't, I don't know when, I, I, don't, I don't know how this thing's going in. I mean, I know how the things go in. But for my personal life, my story's not been written. I don't know what heartache still lies before me. I don't know that. I, I, don't, I don't know what prognosis that I may get medically. I don't, I don't know what may happen uh, in life, accidents, trials. I, I, don't, I, just, I don't know. And you don't know. You don't know. And by the way, part of me is glad I don't know. I don't want to live in fear that way. By the way, this is a side note. I really try to make it a practice whenever I begin to worry about stuff to set aside and say, Lord, help me not to worry about what I ain't got to worry about. I mean, it ain't even happened yet. Don't, what, do you, what are you all fretting? Well, this might happen or what if or this, that, and the other. There ain't no need to worry about it. It ain't happened yet. Just stop worrying about it. But I don't, I don't know how it's all going to end, but I know this. I know that God has a remedy and God has a plan for a troubled heart. Because here's the reality, probably all of us will struggle with this thing of a troubled heart. From time to time, we'll all have to battle this, this attack uh, upon our heart, if you would. We'll all have to battle this overwhelming sense of dread that overcomes our heart. And so I want you to know something, God has a remedy for that troubled heart. Now this is real simple. This is real simple, I'm going to give you these, and I hope you'll allow the Lord to help you. He says, first, first of all, in John 14, 1, he said, let not your heart be troubled. How in the world? Lord, I, I, you know Peter had to be thinking it because Peter, usually if Peter thought it, he said it. What, what do you mean don't be troubled? Lord, you're leaving. Lord, you just told us that you're going to call us. Follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. And Lord, we ain't caught fish. We ain't caught men. We ain't caught nothing. And now you're leaving? How, how can you tell me to not be troubled about this? He said, let not your heart be troubled. Why? You believe in God, believe also in me. Now, I don't think Jesus looked at him and said, hey, Peter, I got this under control. But in essence, let me tell you something. Jesus had it under control. He had it taken care of. He had the situation under control. But here's what I thought about. God's The first step of God's remedy for a troubled heart begins with having the right relationship with him. I think the older I get, the more, the more I preach more on relationship than probably when I ever did when I was younger. You say, why is that? Because anybody can have an outward display of religion. But a relationship changes everything. A relationship changes everything. And when, when you to, to have this, because what's Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, trust me. Trust me. I, I give, this is a really carnal illustration, but you bear with me. Some people like those those uh, those drama shows, those TV shows that uh, you know. I, years ago, when, when it first came out, I, I'm, listen, I'm not a proponent of this. We might even need to we might even need to edit this out. I don't know. But years ago, there was a show on TV called Twenty Four. Do y'all remember Twenty Four? Anybody remember Twenty Four? Jack Bauer. I know y'all did because y'all had the videos. Jack Jack Bauer and all that. And I used to get. If you've never seen it, it it's probably not worth your time to watch it, but. He would always make this statement. Now, he didn't know these people, all right? And he's going in. These people are being shot at. The, you know, the government's turned on. The bad guys are turned on. They're, they're pinned down. And you got this, this office guy, this pencil pusher, that he's got his little nerd, you know, pin protector, pocket protector, and he's got his wire rim glasses on. And he's, and he's knelt down beside this truck, and they're shooting machine guns all over. I mean, just everywhere. Jack Bauer runs over. He says, we got to get from here to there, and I'll get you there. And he says, trust me. And they just get up and run. And my thinking, like, dude, I don't even know you. I don't know these people are shooting at me. I don't know why they're shooting at me. 
apparently they don't like you either because they shot at you all the way over. I ain't trusting nobody. Now, we laugh about that, but listen, Jesus is saying, just trust me. Just trust me. Now, I want you to see, he said, why, why, why can they trust him? Well, you got to hit the rewind button a little bit, right? You got to understand that these men could trust him because they were reminded of that initial relationship. Do you know what it took for them to follow Jesus when he said, follow me? They had to trust him. They had to trust that he is who he said he is. He is that who he says it. And so when they left everything, they had expressed their faith, they had expressed their trust in Jesus back at that moment. And Jesus has said, listen, you believe in God, believe also in me. You followed me back then, just keep following. Just keep trusting. You can't see the outcome. You can't see the whole picture. You don't understand what's going to happen. I mean, it was obvious. Jesus told them, I'm going to die in three days. I'm going to get up. They didn't get it until after he got up. But you know what he says? Listen, just trust me. Where did all that build? Where did that trust build? That trust built from a relationship that they had with him. Listen, when you go through these times of trouble in your life, you know, it, it won't hurt anything. It, I promise you this, it's not going to hurt God's feelings for you to reevaluate your, reevaluate your relationship. <clears throat> you know what I found out? I found out that all of us stray. All of us wonder. All of us are weak. Now, some of us, we know how to put on the act on the outside. But we're talking, we're not talking about the outside. We're talking about what? Let not your heart be troubled. Say, so, preacher, I'm going through some of the darkest days of my life. Maybe you need to go reevaluate that relationship from when it started when you first stepped out and, and listened and responded to follow me. The way it was that day when you stepped out by faith and you didn't have it all figured out back then. You know what you knew? You knew you was a lost sinner. And Jesus said, if you put faith in me, you don't have to go. And you just stepped out and followed him and so maybe there ought to be a reevaluation of that trust because of that relationship. But now here's the very, very real aspect of it. It could be that you've never responded in faith at all and now God has given you an opportunity to have that relationship. <clears throat> and so whatever the case may be tonight, I would say God's remedy for a troubled heart begins with a relationship with him. Now it's going to build from this. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's going to build from this. I really hope he didn't drink out of this this morning. He didn't, I heard it pop. So he said, let not your heart be troubled. It begins with a relationship, okay? <clears throat> Think about this and, and we'll go on. These 11 men were privileged enough to hear these words from Jesus. 11 men. Judas, you know, if you go back in history, Judas has already departed from the upper room. He has already went out set to betray Christ. And so there's Jesus and the 11 men here. Do you know why they got to hear this encouragement of let not your heart be troubled? Do you know why? It's because of where they were in their relationship with Christ. You know, it quite, quite possibly could be the reason that you've never heard the common stillness of the heart of God is maybe you're so far away that you're just not listening. Maybe the sin and the I'm not saying you're lost. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But I'm saying maybe you've just gotten so far away that you're just not listening. Can I tell you? They got to hear these words, let not your heart be troubled because of their relationship with Jesus Christ. All right, number two. God's remedy for a troubled heart begins with a relationship with him. Second of all, God's remedy for a troubled heart includes the promises from him. Now, there's a lot of Bible promises that, that we could claim, and I, I want to I talk to you about their specific situation. I'm convinced of this tonight. <clears throat> a lot of the trouble that we have in our heart circles and centers around the brevity of our life. Whether it be the, the potential of death, the fear of death, the reality of death, the consequences of death, all of those things can bring trouble to our heart. Now when you read this passage, and we oftentimes talk about heaven out of this passage, that's good, but understanding the central focus or the hub of the reason this passage was given was centered around the death of Jesus Christ. So as we talk about those mansions that God's prepared, and man, what a day that's going to be. Understand the reason that we're even having this whole conversation is because of the center of the, of the death of Jesus Christ. And so I want to give you something about as it, as it fits to, to this text. 
Their hearts were prone to, to trouble because the person they loved was going away. They was getting ready to lose a loved one, somebody that was dear to them. Somebody they cared about more than, more than really anything else. They, they loved him. And he loved them. And it, it was, Once he leaves, it's never ever again going to be like it used to be. Boy, that doesn't, doesn't that sound familiar? When we say goodbye to a loved one. It's never, ever, ever going to be like it used to be. Or maybe a circumstance in your life, you say, well, this happened, and now it'll never again be like it used to be. Well, I want to give you the promise that I think he, that, that Jesus gives them. He said, I'm going away, but I'm preparing a place, and I'm coming to get you. Thus, you'll see me again. All right, now, so here's the, here's the context. I'm leaving. You can't come with me. But I'm going to leave you a promise. While I'm gone, you think about this promise. He said, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. You'll see me again. There is a great encouragement, listen to me, that Jesus is coming. Listen, in the, in the heart of all of the heartache and the despair and the heartbreak and, and, and the pain and the suffering and the loss, there is promise to God's people that Jesus, the one who left and went to Calvary, the one who sent him back to the Father, he is coming back and he's going to get those that belong to him. There's comfort in that. Regardless of how bad this life may get, I know that I can keep my eyes to the sky knowing that Jesus is coming. Man, we sing about it. We pray about it. We do all of these things, but sometimes you ought to stop and think about it. Man, my life's over. This bad happened. This and this and this happened. Yes, listen, but Jesus is coming back. It's going to be done. It's going to be settled. We need to see the big picture. The big picture. Jesus is coming. What was their problem? He said, listen, I'm going away, and you can't come with me right now. But I want you to think about this while I'm gone. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I'm going away. I'm going to go prepare a place for you. Preparation was really probably twofold. Number one, he prepared a place because he was going to Calvary. That's how he prepared the place. I don't think we send it up to before it's to heaven. I don't care what the Southern Gospel songs say. Jesus took care of our place. Jesus secured those who can go and dwell in it. Jesus secured the dwelling place. And Jesus is going to make sure he takes care of the transportation from point A to point B. But he said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. Now remember, they was upset. He said, I'm going. You can't come with me. And he said, but I'm going to receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Wasn't it amazing that when Jesus got around, everything kind of seemed to pass away? Problems come, trials come, Jesus came. He said, well, preacher, do you have scripture for that? Absolutely. They said a little upset when the boat got to rocking in the middle of the storm until Jesus came, got up in the ship. Then they were all amazed that he said, peace be still. And the storm stopped and the wind ceased and the waves settled down. You say, why is that? Because they were in the presence of Jesus. I can promise you this. If you just get back to his presence, your storm will cease too. Doesn't mean that your troubles will go away. Oh no, we're waiting for that delivering day. Our flesh groans to put on that, that immortality. There's a groaning, the Bible says. But Jesus is coming. But wait a minute. I got to thinking about how that, you know, the Bible is a practical book, isn't it? Many, uh, we, we've, heard, we've heard testimony this week that there's, there's been people that we love that's passed off the scene. And there's no greater hope to know that when a person dies in Christ, Here's what we always say. Well, we know, we know that they're in a better place now. Let me take a time out. If they don't know Christ as their Savior, they're not in a better place. Right. Hell is real. Eternity is long. And we need to get back to where we stop trying to preach people into heaven and start trying to preach the gospel so they can get into heaven. Amen. But man, what comfort that is for us to know based on the promises of the Word of God that those who die in Christ, we will see them again. But I got to think about this passage. How does this apply? The Bible is a practical, everyday, real book. Okay? So let's use it in a practical, everyday, real application. Maybe you're here this morning, this evening, and, and your heart is heavy because of a lost loved one. Maybe that person that you look back at, you know, and, and by the way, people hold on to hurt for years and years and years. Well, preacher, I know they say, but there's a hole, there's, there's something I'm leaving. Well, I, I thought about this practical side of the promises of God because there's an encouragement 
that we'll see Jesus, right? I find encouragement in that. But I also believe that there's an encouragement because we're also going to see those who've crossed over before us. We would call it this. We would call it a reunion. A reunion. Some of y'all have family reunions. You get the t-shirt and the whole nine. You go to the beach and you find those families and man, there's 50 of them out there and they all got the same matching yellow t-shirts. Miss Joe, your, your family would be yellow t-shirts. There's a reunion. You'll see each other for a long time, but at a reunion, everybody, well, I, I got to thinking about this. So the hope is, Jesus said, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. But can I tell you that when Jesus comes, he's not coming by himself. When I was studying this and I was reading this and praying over this, you know, it's kind of one of the true things that you always know, but the light bulb kind of comes in when it comes together. I want you to listen in context to this, to the troubledness of, of sometimes our hearts, and I want you to listen to what First Thessalonians said, you know, the other funeral passage. He said, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, there's that faith, there's that relationship. Even so, uh, them also uh, which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. And it clicked in my little brain one day that not only that when I see Jesus for the very first time, the very first time I ever lay eyes on Jesus, can I tell you who's going to be with him? Every one of my loved ones that's put their faith and trust in that same Jesus. So I'm going, to, I'm going to see Jesus the very first time and right beside him is going to be this loved one and this loved one and this friend and this grandparent and this one and this one and this church member and this saint of God. And, I, and every single one of them is going to be. Now I'm going to tell you, put it in context. Let not your heart be troubled. Are you listening to me? Jesus knew what he's talking about. He said, I got to trust me. It's under control. We live in a little finite window. Listen, I'm not 50 yet, so if you're 50 and older, raise your hand. You're 50 and older, raise your hand. I'm calling y'all out. That's good. Doesn't it seem like, honestly, doesn't it seem like just yesterday you still in high school? Just yesterday. I know y'all were. Bless your heart. How many of you are 40? I don't know. I mean, it just goes by so, so quick. I'll be, I'll be 50 in January. I know, it's just tough. <laughs> but I'm telling you, it, it's, it's just so fast. It's so fast. And you, you, don't, you don't get a do-over. I don't get a mulligan. I don't even play golf. I don't get a mulligan. I don't get any of that. Jared, it's over. It's quick. It's over. Now, I'm not saying that to depress you, but I'm telling you, if the only thing that I ever look through is my little window and my little looking glass, it's easy for my heart to remain troubled. Yeah. But if I can ever get to the place that there's coming a glad reunion day, that there's coming a day that every person that's ever professed Jesus personal Savior because he went away and he prepared that place on Calvary. Every individual that's ever bowed their heart and confessed him before God and repented of being a sinner and trusted Christ as their Savior, we might say goodbye on this side. My heart might be heavy and sad for a while, but if I look at the perspective of everything that God says, there is coming a reunion day. And when I see Jesus, only thing I've got to do is slip around and I'm going to see every single one of them. Man, there's comfort in that. Let not your heart be troubled. It's bad. We'll say our goodbyes and we'll weep and we'll cry and we'll be brokenhearted, but I don't have to let that bring me to the point of overthrow. Say why? I can trust him. I can trust him. And so we have a promise here. He said, wherefore comfort one another with these words. By the way, I like this. I'm going somewhere and you can't come to me right yet. But if you read 1 Thessalonians, he said, I, I, I go to prepare a place for you and John. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. He said, you can't go now, but there's coming a day you're going to get to go. 1 Thessalonians said, we're going to meet him in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Listen, he's got it figured out. He knows what he's doing. Let not your heart be troubled. 
God's remedy for a broken heart begins with a relationship. God's remedy for a broken heart is backed with a promise. But that promise leads us to another promise. God's remedy for a broken heart includes a comforter. Now here's, here's this is the real life living for me. Trouble's here, but I have a relationship with Christ. Hope is over there because I know that he's coming. But what do I do between now and then? How, how do I get by? You say, well, preacher, all that sounds fine and good. And I know the truth of that, but I'm still crying myself to sleep at night. I still don't understand why this is happening. I still don't understand how I'm supposed to go on and face tomorrow when everything is falling apart today. Well, I'm glad that you asked that question. Do you know that Jesus address that very thing. He said, how are, we, how are we going to survive? But Lord, you don't understand. We've walked everything that we've done for three and a half years, we've done because you're right here telling us where to go. We haven't traveled. We haven't preached. We haven't ate. We haven't done anything, God, without your direction and instruction. And now you're saying you're leaving. And you're telling me not to worry, God, because you're coming back, but what do we do in the meantime? That's so simple. Verse number 16 of chapter number 14, he says, I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. You know what that comforter's ministry, what his timeline of that ministry is? It's from the time that Jesus sent him. When did they get him? Well, he got, they got the indwelling of him in Acts. So preacher, how did that all work out? Come to Sunday school next Sunday, Brother Jason will lay all that out for you. They got the indwelling of him in Acts. The fulfillment of John 15 will we'll make our abode with you. Okay? But that's going to carry them through either till they die or until Jesus comes to get them. But he said, I'll pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter. Now those of you that's heard me preach any length of time, have heard me preach on that word, another. It's another of the same kind, just like me. Just like me. You say, well, I can't see Jesus. No, but he gave another comforter just like him. Now, to these men, that was very significant because they had heard never man spake like this man. There is no other Jesus. There is no one that speaks like you. There is no one that, that teaches like you. There is no one that speaks like one having authority. God, there is no other. He said, yes, but I'm going to go away and I'm going to pray and ask my father. Brother Jason gave that illustration this morning in Sunday school. I would tell you to go back and watch the video, but you, you should have been there. He said, I'm going to ask my father. I'm going to pray. And I'm going to ask my father to send you another comforter. Now we know who that comforter is. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, talking about the spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, the third person of the Godhead. He said, I, me as God the Son, I'm going to go back to God the Father, but I'm going to pray as God the Son to God the Father. He'll send God the Holy Spirit, and that way you'll still have God. And he shall give you another comforter. The word comforter is the word called, it's the word paraclete. It means one that's called along beside of. There are times in this life, man, we just need somebody not to lean on, but to fall on. We can't walk. We can't, we can't function. We can't do all this. The, the word, that, again, that word comfort, that word paraclete is one that Jesus literally says, I'm going to call, I'm going to pray that God brings someone and he's going to come right up beside you. And when you're hurting, he'll hold. When you're heavy hearted, he'll help. You say, why? That's his ministry. I pray the Father, he will send you another kind, not a different kind, just like me. Now, when you look at the context of this, of this passage of Scripture, we know that there were still a lot of uncertainties, right? There's a lot of things that the disciples still didn't understand. But let me tell you what I found out about these disciples. These disciples finished their course. These disciples went on. They made it through the crucifixion. They made it through the resurrection. They made it through the persecution that was coming. They made it through the preaching and the trials and all of those things. You say, why is that? Because they were able to allow the Lord to help their troubled heart. I was thinking about the promises, how that God promised to be with us, right? The, the very name that was given to Christ was Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. 
Matthew 28 and 20, right before Jesus ascends, this is after this context, right before the Acts 1 account, before Jesus ascends back. He gives this, this portion of scripture in Matthew 28, and he tells his disciples, a familiar passage of scripture, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. To the end of the age, I am with you every single step of the way. Jesus tells them that. Hebrews 13, 5, Paul quotes what? I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. That's, that's an interesting verse. I always heard this in Bible college. You can read it backward. Forsake thee, leave thee, never will I. Never will I leave thee nor forsake. It's, it's the same truth front to back. It doesn't make any difference. He will never, never leave. Galatians 2, 20, we just finished. We found out this. Christ liveth in me. 2 Corinthians 7, 5, and 6, I like this and I'm done. Paul made this statement. He said, for when we come to Ma into Macedonia, for, for when we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Man, have you, has your life ever felt that way? I just, I, I can't catch a break. I mean, I get, I get one, and, then I, and this, this falls apart, and, and then this falls apart, and this falls, I, I just can't catch a break. Paul said, we're troubled on every side. Without were frightenings, within were fears. Man, that sounds like life. We're afraid of what's on the outside. We're afraid of what's on the inside. Man, there's a wrestling and there's an unsettledness. But listen to what Paul said. Nevertheless, God. Isn't that good? Nevertheless, God, that comforteth those that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus. Now listen, there's a lot of preaching in that. God uses people. It's not just God. God puts people in our life to help us and strengthen us just as he did. But I want you to understand what he said. He said, we were troubled. I'm not, I'm not here to preach you because you're going through difficulties in life. It's not it whatsoever. Man, my heart goes out to you. All of us go through those things. Paul went through them. We're troubled on every side. There were frightenings without. There was fear within. He said, but never, don't, don't, don't misinterpret this whatsoever. He said, God is always faithful. Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down. If you're here tonight and you say, preacher, life is absolutely kicked me in the teeth. I, listen, I, I'm not arguing with you. I'm not, I don't deny any of that. Preacher, we, we, these, these have been, we, we faced some things in the last month, two months, two years that I, I just can't even explain and I feel like that I'm cast down. Can I tell you, listen, God has a remedy. God has a remedy for a troubled heart. Where does it start? It starts with a relationship. Maybe you just need to be reminded tonight of that time way back in, in its purity and in its innocence when you just stepped out by faith and put your faith in Jesus Christ and say, Lord, forsaken all, I trust thee. Forsaken all, I trust him. That's an acrostic for faith. Maybe you just need to be reminded of that relationship. If you're here tonight and you don't know Christ as your Savior, you need to have that relationship. And you're fighting an uphill battle in this life. If you think it's going to get better or easier without Christ, you're fully misinterpreting what the Scripture teaches. So maybe not you need to be reminded of the relationship. Maybe you ought to focus on these promises just a little bit. See, I'm heartbroken. I've lost this loved one of this situation. Listen, Jesus is coming. He's got it under control. Look at the big picture. He is coming. And maybe you're here tonight and you say, well, here's what I need. I just need someone. I just need someone to lean on. Can I tell you, if you have a relationship with him, you have him. You have the Spirit of God who lives, dwells, and abides with you. Allow him to help you. Call on him while he's near. Cast your care upon him. Pour your heart out to him. And allow him to help your troubled heart. Would you stand with me tonight? I'm going to ask Miss Stephanie to make her way to the piano. And Thank you for listening tonight. I really believe that I preached what the Lord wanted me to preach. She's going to play a verse or two of invitation tonight. Maybe, maybe this evening if you're here, I, I, don't know, I don't know what you're carrying. And I'm not so much care, worried about the weight on your shoulders as I am the trouble in your heart. <clears throat> if you need to slip out from where you're at tonight and just say, Lord, help me to, help me to think and to focus. Help me to see the big picture. It's okay to tell him you're troubled. He already knows. It's okay to tell him, God, I'm dealing with things and I feel overwhelmed. 
I don't understand why life has, has happened this way. Sometimes, if we're honest, we do understand. God, I understand why this has happened. I got out of your will, whatever. My, listen, God can restore all of those things. Let not your heart be troubled. There's that relationship. You believe in God, believe also in me. There's a promise. He's coming back. This is not the end of the chapter. This is not the end of the story. Your trouble is not the end of the story. I promise you that. God's got a plan. Tonight, would you be very aware of the fact that God has given to His children another comforter that will help you during the darkest hours of the night He'll help you during the morning hours. He'll help you when your eyes are filled with tears. He'll help you when your mind is confused and you just don't know which way to turn. He is one that's been called along beside you to go with you, to strengthen you. Allow Him to help you. not rushing tonight there's people still praying you take your time maybe in combination with this morning service I wonder if you've really done business with the Lord today <clears throat> if you walk out that door, those, these doors tonight and you'll give an account to God with what he's done for your heart and in your heart can you honestly say I've minded the Lord today I hope so. Another verse. Just mind the Lord. <clears throat> 